Hey, all you Ethicuties, welcome to the keynote for Ethics First Day. This is our final session. We're gonna be diving in with some uh, really great insights from this awesome panel. Really quick, this is our keynote. So guess how many books we're giving away? We're giving, a, we're giving away 20. So stay active in that chat, ask your questions and we will try to integrate them. Remember also that this is a 90 minute session uh, and we're gonna get we're gonna get going real quick. I also just wanna, if you don't, if you don't have these books, click this QR code and uh, you can see our entire library. You can see links to the uh, Amazon page to go ahead and order them, or you can just be really active in the chat and you can win one. We also have uh, prize packs available. Look at this, imagine FCPA guidebook by Tom Fox. We have uh, ethics versus day hoodies and also a super secret gift. So if you've been to all three sessions, you'll, you'll be entered into win uh, one of these prize packs. Or if you haven't gone to all three sessions, share something on LinkedIn and we'll enter you in as well. Also just wanna share a couple of these podcasts. I know I keep talking about them, uh, but the Compliance uh, Leaders Lounge or the Compliance Executives Lounge with Ross Ronan is phenomenal. And I also wanna shout out um, uh, Reed Blackman from the first session, his Ethical Machines podcast is awesome. So if you're nervous about AI, wanna learn a little bit more about it, I would uh, encourage you to check those out. How's it going? Uh, camera change. See, new studio, camera's changing. I'm not even ready for this all yet. All right, I'm going to go ahead and pass this over to the coolest guy in compliance, Matt Kelly, and we are going to dive right in. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Nick, and thank you for everybody joining us for our last session of the day. This should be an excellent discussion. Uh, as he mentioned, we are scheduled to go for about 90 minutes or so. Our objective here is to talk about how to handle government investigations and how to build a compliance program that will satisfy regulators expectations when you do have a matter that you're looking to resolve uh, and we have an excellent panel let me pull up their cyborg images here and let's see uh, first we had nick co-ceo of ethico he's already there nick is going to be manning the comments and questions so if you have any pop them in and he will be feeding them to me uh, we have kenneth polite who is the former Assistant Attorney General for the Criminal Division uh, in the Biden administration, left, I can I want to say about a year ago, maybe a little bit less, I Almost, can't quite yeah, remember. Yeah, end of uh, July, it'll be a year. End of July. And these days he is a partner at uh, Sidley Austin, uh, where he works on government investigations. Um, also with us is Wei Chen. So Wei is the former, and I believe first, Compliance Counsel Expert at the Justice Department during the Obama administration. Uh, also previously uh, worked in compliance at Microsoft and elsewhere. Uh, these days has just launched her new advisory firm, CDE Advisors, which stands for Compliance Data and, wait, what does the E stand for? I forget. Culture, Data and Ethics. Culture, Data and Ethics staying in front of ABC, taking it further. Very, very clever. Um, and then also joining us is uh, Andrew McBride, who is the former head of compliance for Albemarle. And if that rings any bells, that is because Albemarle just had a large FCPA settlement uh, late last year that attracted a lot of attention. And Andrew guided the company through all of that. And these days is working as an independent compliance consultant. Uh, so Andrew, Thank you for being here as well. And one Pleasure. program of the year. Oh, yes. Amazing. Program of the year. That's amazing. Yeah. Uh, real quick, uh, 10,000 is the goal. So the last session had almost 10,000 emoji reactions. So let's finish strong here uh, and keep those coming. But welcome, everyone. So for this session here, I wanted to carve this up basically into sequence of going through <clears throat> an investigation. Uh, we'll have some questions about how you would actually approach the government, what is that very early stage of communicating with them and assessing where your compliance program did or didn't measure up, questions at the start, questions about the middle and trying to get to a resolution, and then questions at the far end, you have a resolution, you're probably still going to be laboring under some sort of deferred prosecution agreement, non-prosecution agreement, possibly a corporate probation or something like that, but there will be an extended period after the resolution where you still have compliance duties that you have to keep in mind. We're going to try and ask questions about all three of those phases. Before I get into those specifics though, I did want to start with sort of a curtain raiser question for all three of our panelists here. Basically just 
What do you think is the biggest misconception the compliance community has about government in, uh, regulate investigations and resolutions? What would you want to tell listeners today that, no, I get why you might think that, but here's how it really is. What What, what is that thing? Um, Ken, I'll start with you and then Wei and then sure. Andrew, but give us a sense of what you think people don't quite understand. So this is a, a misconception, misconception a bit, but it's in, it, it's uh, due in part to the, the emphasis that the department and that the media often makes on the dollars associated with resolutions, be it tens or hundreds of millions of dollars, in some cases, billions of dollars. Uh, but for the men and women who are in the department who are working on these resolutions, the dollars are not their focus. It's not what drives the resolution. Uh, their focus is uh, oftentimes uh, specifically on what is the company going to be able to do to help support their ongoing investigations of uh, the most culpable individuals. Uh, it's what is the company doing uh, to ensure that this misconduct isn't repeated within that company? Uh, so what improvements are being made to the compliance program and are there changes across the enterprise to ensure that this is not repeated? Uh, and then uh, uh, quite frequently and increasingly, I would say the company's prior misconduct, its criminal history, uh, are the factors that prosecutors really focus on in terms of crafting the resolution the dollars associated, the, the the thing that oftentimes gets the most splash in the press uh, is, is one of the, the least significant considerations. All right. Wei, what would you say? I'm going to try to squeeze in one extra. So I'm going to mention two. Uh, the sure. one huge misconception is that enforcement bodies are one single minded homogenous entity with a single mind and a, a, a you know, consistent understanding and appreciation and uh, about compliance. Um, these are organizations made of individuals, just like any organization is. Uh, individuals have different interests, different views, different knowledge levels, different ways of looking at things. Um, really, to talk about either DOJ, SEC, or whomever as a single-minded, homogenous body, um, I think it's a big, big and common mistake. The second thing that I would say is that compliance, to think that compliance is the single piece of puzzle that determines what resolution you get, that's a mistake. Um, compliance is one of 10 Philip factors. And of the 10 Philip factors, well, compliance is arguably one and a half of um, uh, uh, the Philip factors. The, the single piece that actually is the most important is not even a Phillips factor it is the strength of the government's case. The, the kind of resolution you get is mostly dependent on how strong the government's case is, how strong is their evidence. Compliance is not, is not the one piece that determines what resolution you get. All right. And I should add uh, that you had mentioned there can be challenges dealing with multiple regulators who may have different or even dueling perspectives on a case. We're going to ask those questions later on. Um, maybe we might even get back to the Phillips factors, which are named after a former deputy AG from, I want to say, about 15 years ago. Uh, who like drafted, that. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, Mark Phillip. Uh, and, you know, he did draft uh, plans for how companies should be prosecuted. And we can talk about what some of the other issues are. But Andrew, you're looking at this from the perspective of an actual compliance officer and the actual attendees here. Yeah. What would you say for misconceptions that compliance officers should clear up in their heads? I think I would focus on the scope of the root cause remediation and the program effectiveness testing in a government investigation. I mean, they are potentially much broader than you might think. Uh, for example, in our root cause remediation efforts associated with the FCPA investigation, it went way beyond kind of improving our third party due diligence processes. It addressed every element of the inquire to cash process. So how customer opportunities were captured, uh, ERP master data was recorded, the configuration of the company's CRM system, 
the manual and the system controls, the screening, the due diligence, the contracting, the transaction and reputational monitoring and the training. And all of that requires significant collaboration with the sales team and global sales process owners, the legal department and, and IT. And then on program testing, we'll get onto this a little bit later, that expected level of testing is both deeper and broader. And so you know, one example of that, there's a lot of focus in the DOJ evaluation of corporate compliance programs. But then if you, you look at Schedule C of any MPA or DPA, including Albemarle's, you know, that expected testing goes well beyond the traditional accountabilities of a compliance team, particularly around things like financial controls, separation of duties, delegations of authority, and auditing. And that execution of that testing similarly requires extensive collaboration with other functions. And so as a compliance professional, Going in, you, you really have to kind of demonstrate that curiosity and humility to learn and get to grips with those other functional processes because it's so critical to your remediation efforts and your program effectiveness testing. Okay. Uh, so I now want to start by asking, as I said, some of the questions about how things work at the beginning of an investigation and getting to a resolution. Uh, and... You know, I wanted to start with the very first. So your company has an incident, a violation, and the very first question is, should you voluntarily self-disclose this or not? And the Justice Department has been quite clear that if you voluntarily self-disclose, a whole lot of other stuff can get easier. Even if you have some very unflattering circumstances behind it, the voluntary self-disclosure matters a lot. I am wondering, though, is this still... A, like, is this still a battle in the boardrooms with the CEO, with the general counsel that should they voluntarily disclose? Are there companies that still kind of default to keeping their mouths closed? Um, if it is still a battle, how are compliance officers supposed to think about that? And maybe I'll ask Way first and then Andrew and then Ken, because Ken, you gave speeches on this when you were at Justice Department. Um but, you know, what should we think about voluntary self-disclosure? I'm sort of of the mind that, well, of course, a company's going to do that now because they'll be able to you know, avoid a lot of headache. But am I wrong in that way? What would you say? Yes, I would challenge that. You know, I, I would challenge the notion that self-disclosure is always the right move. Um, mm -hmm. And I would I would counsel folks to resist the automatic jump from finding misconduct to self-disclosure. Because I think it's important before you try to even convince your stakeholders to convince yourself first. What is the evidence and what is the legal analysis of the cost and, and then you know, cost and benefits of self-disclosure? Do your homework. What do you know about the misconduct at this point? What evidence do you have? What evidence would the government be able to get on its own if you do not self-disclose? Because I certainly do know companies, um, not not you know not a small number of companies that have chosen not to self-disclose, and I will say, nothing has happened to them, and many of them the statute of limitation has run, um, and that this is not. I'm not saying companies shouldn't go fix the problem, but concluding that self-disclosure is one way, one the the only way to you know. To, to address this issue, I think is something that needs more thought. Um, the analysis really goes, DOJ is saying that if you self-disclose, we'll be nice to you. But the question is, if we don't self-disclose, would you ever find out? And I think that's a question that requires much more rigorous analysis about what evidence do you have? What evidence is the government able to obtain without your cooperation? Um, what is your, your status on um, how you remediate the, the misconduct that you have found? And I'm gonna go back to that Phillips factors, right? So, so this is from a former memo from Mark Phillips, but it's been enshrined in the United States, oh, I'm sorry, now called Justice Manual, used to be called the U.S. Attorney's <laughs> Manual. Um, and, I still uh, slip up and call it the U.S. The US I know, <laughs> Attorney Manual. Exactly. <laughs> Me too. So they, uh, it's been enshrined there for over a decade now. Um, 
self-disclosure is also one of 10 factors in there. Again, one of 10, not the only one, one of 10. So I'm not saying it's the, it's the right thing or the wrong thing to make that move. I, I'm, all I'm saying is I think I would resist any automatic conclusion that you always go from here to here. But I think I would counsel people to give it much more rigorous thought and analysis than, you know, than I often hear. Okay. Andrew, and, uh, um, what, what would you respond to on that given the 18 yeah. months, I think at Arbemarle, what's your reaction to that and how much of what Hui said uh, contributed to that, to that time period? Yeah. So, I mean, I completely agree with Wei here. So, I mean, you have to be careful that you don't come across as being the morality police here of, you know, thou must self-disclose because that won't be well received by management or, or the board. You know, as, as, as chief compliance officer, I saw my role in conjunction with general counsel and outside counsel in ensuring that management and the board are in possession of the full facts and the pros and cons of self-disclosure. And as a, you know, way back when, I used to be an antitrust lawyer, and we've been doing that kind of assessment with cartel leniency applications for, for years. So the decision for Albemarle self-report was taken before I joined, so I can't really comment on the specifics for that and also just from a confidentiality point of view. But I will say that the decision to self-report back in 2017, 2018 is very different perhaps to one that's being made now. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, back then, even the fact of making a self-report was still pretty new and the concepts of timely disclosure were really only beginning to, to, to crystallize. It's great to see the credit that Albemarle got, but the whole process from start of the investigation through to the resolution took nearly seven years, countless management and board meetings, significant outside advisor spend, the reputational damage, and a follow-on shareholder derivative lawsuit. So it's a pretty significant decision, very significant decision. But... That said, as I said, you know, the decision to self-report now in 2024 is quite different. First, the, the risk assessment around not self-disclosing, um, you know, perhaps the likelihood of the DOJ finding out about the conduct in question is higher. They've talked publicly about all of the enhanced data analytics tools that they're now using to uncover problematic conduct. And then perhaps with all of the incentives being introduced for whistleblowers, perhaps whistleblowers are more likely to come forward. And then secondly, the, the, the benefits of, of self-disclosure is now clearer guidance on, you know, the prospects of getting a declination and an expedited declination, particularly if your disclosure is prompt. The life core biomedical case is a good example of that. But you still, even with that, you have to go in with your eyes wide open. So you know, where you start up, start with an investigation is not necessarily where you'll, you'll end up. And, and there'll be very, various aspects of the way in which your investigation was conducted that will be judged by the prevailing standard at the time of resolution, not when you reported. So that could be positive and negative. So on the positive, the negative side, it's been well documented, Albemarle did not get the credit for timely disclosure. Um, but then back in 2018, 2019, when it was making decisions about clawing back bonuses of executives, it was doing that in line with its core values. It wasn't doing that because of a clawback policy, because there was no such clawback policy or credit against the penalty at that, that time. And so there are many, many um, factors, I think, that go into it. And so um, really trying to kind of get the facts around the actual investigation, what you know, as we were saying earlier, and then all of those additional factors is key. So, Ken, give me your take on this as well, and including, like, what are the expectations for speedy self-disclosure? Because Andrew raises a very good, valid point that the company needs to establish some basic understanding. But, you know, I can remember there was a case, I don't remember the specific company, but they had placed an appointment with the DOJ basically to self-disclose, but between when they called to make the appointment and the actual appointment, it got out in the press. And then that kind of jeopardized voluntary self-disclosure. And I sometimes wonder if boards can 
get lost in the head games of how quickly should we say this and what if we don't really know enough to give much information? Like, how does the DOJ think that through? Sure. So I just on the first point, I, I think Andrew and Way have kind of articulated exactly where I am uh, related to uh, this battle around voluntary self-disclosure or not. Uh, we we represent a lot of companies, uh, and it's interesting to see that uh, there's a lot of managers, a lot of boards who are reflexive in their uh, position as to voluntary self-disclosure. That is, they come into uh, the initial days of confronting misconduct, and some boards are, we are absolutely self-disclosing, and then others are, we will never self-disclose. Uh, and, and so the real battle oftentimes is getting these companies to engage in the more nuanced, rigorous process of going through the facts and circumstances, evaluating the strengths and weaknesses that come with voluntary self-disclosure. I mean, look, the department's done a great job of messaging here. There are there are companies out there that think they are under an obligation, in fact, to voluntary, voluntarily self-disclose uh, based on the way that this is sometimes framed when, when that is not uh, oftentimes that is not uh, not the case at all. To your uh, to your 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 second point about reasonably prompt self disclosure, I, I think this is an area where I think the department could do uh, do itself and do uh, the corporate landscape uh, some real benefit by by increasing the amount of detail that they offer in their resolutions around this particular issue. Uh, there was one case recently where. The department specifically uh, outlined the fact that they were not considering uh, self-disclosure as being reasonably prompt. And my recollection is was that it was almost 18 months or so after the time when the company learned of the, the underlying misconduct. They had engaged in an internal investigation uh, with outside counsel involved. Uh, and it was almost nine months after outside counsel had determined that there were credible findings of misconduct before they walked that information into the department. That was evaluated as not being reasonably prompt. Uh, so we have have some uh, we have that decision and maybe a, a less than a handful of others that kind of clearly uh, offer some detail around the department's thinking around that space. But that is uh, that is a challenge. That's an opportunity for improvement, in my view around the department's transparency in this space. Uh, here's a question from the audience that already is pretty much right on point with this. And I guess I'll put it maybe to you, Ken, and then Wei, since you both have DOJ and outside counsel experience. And Andrew, if you have any other thoughts as well after that. But basically, the person is asking, um, of the organizations that do self-disclose, are there any characteristics about these organizations that have stood out to you or any patterns of you know, that? That's where the, the question ends. But um, Ken, do you have any other thoughts? I mean, you kind of touched on it about they do a thoughtful analysis, but they don't drag their feet on it. And way after that, if you have any thoughts, too. Yeah, I mean, look, they, I think. Uh, go ahead, wait. No, no, you go. Uh, All right, I'll go. I, I, Just I, I, I think I think that there's a there's there are oftentimes some some clear characteristics there. I think credibility of of the council involved, their uh, their representations around cooperation and providing uh, clear, consistent cooperation is pledged early and often, uh, and it is in both word and deed. And it's council and companies that are following through on what they're saying as part of the. Uh, as part of the production, as a part of their ongoing cooperation, uh, I, I think you you often see the companies that that come in voluntarily self-disclose and often get some benefit from it uh, are marked by that, along with a, a high commitment to ensuring that the conduct itself is not repeated. So they're 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 interested in making the long-term investment necessary in their compliance functions. Okay. Way, what do you think? I think I would add that they, that the ones I've seen, they really run the gamut. So there are the ones that are thoughtful and and have done their homework um, and before choosing to self-disclose and handle the process appropriately. And there are those who sort of you know rush and come, and then there are those who 
um, well, I'm thinking uh, one particular example that that still stays with me all these years later was this this small organization, this small nonprofit organization that discovered a misconduct in um, in a uh, you know in a foreign country, uh, maybe three four years prior, and it involved not a great amount of money. It was, as far as we could tell, like a single incident, um, and uh, they came in for a self-disclosure. And I will tell you, when we, when the prosecutors and I left the room, uh, we looked at each other and go, "Why the heck are they here?" Um, <laughs> so they're going to go out and tell a story that because we self-disclosed, we, you know, got declined. The truth is, probably no one would have gone after them anyway. Andrew, do you have any other thoughts on this point about uh, characteristics along these lines of uh, companies that want to self-disclose? No, I mean, I think the only um, outside of the scope of our own FCPA investigation, there's that, you know, that that constant challenge when you're kind of managing, running investigations of, you know, where's that kind of dividing line um, between kind of like getting to the resolution and at what point are you stopping the investigation because there are another allegations to to kind of like ferret out, which may lead to other allegations that need to be addressed. And so it's a very fluid situation. And so, you know, working with the, the general counsel and with your outside counsel to define that moment where you are then coming to a resolution and then you're having the engagement with management and then with board and then just making the decision to self-report. It's a very nuanced process. So I, I also wanted to ask, let's take it one step further now. So the instance has happened. The company has decided to self-disclose. They've had a preliminary discussion with the fraud section. I'm curious about what sort of preliminary fundamental processes should the company have in place to make sure that during the regulator's investigation, this is going to be a fruitful, as pain-free as possible process. So on the company side, and I'll put it to you, Andrew, first, like, what do you want to get squared away for internal processes about this is what compliance does, this is what legal will do, this is how we're going to interact with outside counsel. There's a lot of moving parts there. Uh, and then Hui yeah. and Ken, I'll also ask you, what should a company expect about dealing with the regulator, the U.S. attorney, the fraud section, or whomever, but what would the regulator want to see for smooth lines of communication and what expectations would they have as the investigation gets rolling? But Andrew, I'll start with you on the internal yeah. side. What would you say? Yeah, so you know, my situation was a little bit different in that I joined the company 16 months into the internal investigation. And, and that investigation was being led by the, the general counsel and an and outside counsel. My second week at the company, I was handed a pretty extensive root cause analysis, not too dissimilar to what you now see in the MPA and the SEC cease and desist order. And so my priority was the root cause remediation, building the broader compliance program and building a brand new compliance team. And as much as I wanted to, I could not delve into the absolute minutiae of an investigation that spanned multiple countries. It was a black hole from which I would have never have emerged. And so we adopted a hybrid model where we had outside counsel, GC, kind of continuing to run the day-to-day -day of the investigation. It was an independent investigation. And then I obviously took the responsibility for the remediation and, and the compliance program. And I had outside counsel, compliance counsel to support me uh, in that. And then every month or so, we would all meet in person in Charlotte as a group uh, where material updates from the investigation would be provided. And then the vast majority of the meeting, everyone would be turning to me and saying, all right, you know, what you've been doing? Uh, what, what work have you been doing on the root cause of the remediation? What are the broader compliance program improvements that you're putting in place? And I think that that clarity of structure for my situation um, worked really, really well. Um, now, had the investigation started when I was at Albemarle, then I think the approach would have been a little bit different in terms of my involvement in, in the investigation. And then just building the bridge to what Kenneth and, and we're going to address on the government side, for me, in terms of my engagement with the government, 
it was very important for me to develop that kind of direct relationship with the DOJ and the SEC in terms of a position of trust that, you know, I, I was going to speak honestly and frankly about what was working, what was not working. And it wasn't all just painting a, p- a picture of, of, of perfection. And, and that was about my relationship with, with, with the government. Okay. And then, Ken, I'll turn to you first, and then, Wei, what would you want companies to be thinking about to sort of establish those standard operating procedures or fundamentals for however long the investigation might go on, which could be years? You know, what would you want them to have in place as the regulator, the investigator, is working with them? Yeah. It's so it's so great to have to hear from Andrew on this uh, since he's lived it so uh, so so recently and so up close, um, you know. I think the preservation of, of of evidence is always at the forefront of the way the department thinks about about this. And so, um, you know, they've added provisions in the the CEP that specifically talk about communications channels, for example, preservation of evidence. Their the company's ability to assist the de- the department in making uh, further investigations is always going to be at the forefront of their thoughts. So, in addition to compliance and legal and outside counsel, all coordinating the way that Andrew's describing um, coordination with IT within an organization is oftentimes a critical relationship, um, increasingly so, uh, and that it's at the forefront of the way that uh, the the credibility of the investigation is evaluated by the department. I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, that that outreach, the credibility of your counsel oftentimes uh, is a valuable resource. But at some point, the department's, uh, uh, the the deciders around these resolutions are going to be asking questions uh, much more fundamental around, uh, you know, what what did your company do when you first found out about this misconduct? You know, like, what did you do in the in those initial moments? What did you do? Did you bury your hand in the sand? Did you try to cover up uh, information, evidence, and whatnot? Did you decide not to remediate it, regardless of whether you voluntarily self-disclose or not? Did you start trying to clean it up from the very beginning? Did you try to improve your compliance program to ensure that it's not repeated? Um, or did you do something else? And so that, that the evaluate the evaluation around the company's initial decisions around finding out about mis- misconduct oftentimes are very critical to the department's considerations. Okay, Wei, what would you say? I'm going to echo both um, Andrew and and Ken uh, in saying that you really need to think about who's going to be the face of your company in the process, and it doesn't have to be one face, right? But it has to be. You know, who is the key message carrier? Who's going to be the one interfacing with the, the, the prosecutors? Um, also, who is going to be, uh, you know, focusing on the remediation piece? Who is going to focus on the investigation piece? Having those roles very clear. Now, I will also say that in most cases, um, when I was in the fraud section, we preferred seeing company representatives, if a phase actually from the company, show up with the outside counsel. Um, I have personally found many, some of the outside counsel behave very differently when their client <laughs> is in a room and not, versus not in a room. Um, and it's, it's not always in a good way. Um, so, but having said that, I will also say there are some clients who are better, who would have been better off hidden. So, so this is a, there's a lot of dynamics at play, and it really is thinking through how much do you trust your outside counsel to be your face if you choose not to be there? Because DOJ will not make that analysis to say, oh, we don't like what this person said or how this person is behaving. But he, yeah, he's the outside counsel. I'm sure the company is good. They're not going to go that dive into that relationship. Whatever your counsel says is you, is attributed to you. What your counsel does is attributed to you. Your counsel chooses to be very you know, combative, you're gonna be seen as combative. Chooses to be groveling, you're gonna be seen as groveling. Um, so, so they do represent you in every way. So be very, very careful um, that you are comfortable with that representation. 
Okay. Let, um, let me just maybe, follow maybe up. Just one I, other point too. Sorry, go ahead, Kenneth. I'm sorry. Let me just. I wanted to just follow up on one point that Wei was making about the presentations and the the people who accompany outside counsel to some of these presentations. I agree with the way oftentimes having a CEO or board chair there uh, shows a commitment, shows tone at the top, perhaps. Uh, oftentimes having a compliance professional, if not the chief compliance officer is part of that process. That team is also viewed favorably. What I would caution you to to consider though, is that whoever you have there at, at those meetings should be prepared and empowered to actually answer the questions of the Department of Justice if if the prosecutor turns to them and asks them a question. Uh, I can tell you there there have been times when uh, there, there's been a chief compliance officer in those, those presentations, and I've turned to the chief compliance officer and asked her a question, and the general counsel instead answered the question. And that uh, is the type of situation that really underscored the lack of voice that the compliance function had in the organization itself. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, that was the point I was about to make was, you know, you've got to be as a compliance officer in that room, you've got to be very clear about, you know, effectively, when you're talking about the, the compliance program and the remediation efforts, it's the work that you as compliance officer has done. And that, you know, for the general counsel or, or outside counsel to step in and speak on your behalf is going to see, be seen negatively. Mm -hmm. Let me actually just tell you a, a very brief story about one, one company who is, <laughs> I wish I could mention the name. If I mentioned the yeah. name, you, I, you would get your 1,000 emojis right away. Um, <laughs> so, so, but this is a very well-known company that is currently in the news a lot. And when we were dealing with them, we sat across the, the table from their general counsel, who is sort of an old school gentleman, and their chief compliance officer. First thing that, from our perspective, that was alarming was when we started mentioning, start, started discussing certain details of the investigation, the compliance officer was clearly not in the loop. I mean, she was so clearly out of the loop, she just looked like a deer in the headlight um, in, the, you know, in, the, in the middle of this uh, discussion. And then at some point, we were also talking about the company's policy and training and all that. So we asked the general counsel, um, so, you know, what do you do um, when people don't follow your policy? And I'm not kidding you. His straight answer to us right away was, well, I will go break their legs. <laughs> okay. <laughs> was what he said to us. Well, doesn't even hire play. somebody to go and do it How did you receive her. that? <laughs> We were a bit stunned. We I still, I mean, the prosecutors who were in that room and I uh, today, just last week, where we're catching up on the phone, we still <laughs> talked about that. <laughs> it's uh, one of those ones where you try to have a poker face at the time and then after the exactly. meeting, you're just like, oh yes, my gosh, what like, just happened? You're like, are you kidding me? <laughs> um, we had a couple of questions from the audience about whistleblowers, and I wanted to pose them to you all. I guess, Ken and Wei, this might be one first for you, uh, but what happens when the company self-discloses, and it turns out a whistleblower has already beaten them to it? Uh, Ken, what happens? And then, Wei, if you had any other add-ons after that. I mean, look, I think every every voluntary self-disclosure policy makes clear that it has to be information that was unknown to the government at the time of the disclosure from the company. And so it would technically not qualify for whatever benefits are outlined in the policy. Uh, yeah, I would agree with that. But I will also tell you um, that sometimes, you know, whistleblower complaints get lost. Fair enough. Uh, and then somebody else was asking, what if whistleblowing is discouraged by the company? Now, that, that gets a little bit ahead of where we are in our sequential investigation. But, you know, if um, if it comes to light that uh, in the department's estimation or in the regulator's estimation, you know, this is a discouraging whistleblower culture, how unfavorably could that look for the company? Um, Ken and Wei, again, I don't know if you had any thoughts about that. Sorry, can you repeat that? I was just distracted mm -hmm. by one of the questions that I was saying. What, uh, what if whistleblowing has been discouraged by the company and, you know, that that's become clear that they have a culture of covering up as opposed to uh, encouraging whistleblowers? 
uh, how poorly can that reflect on the company? How much more hot water do they get in if that comes to light? Um, Ken, what would you say? And then Wei, what would you say? Yeah, I mean, look, assess, assessing the culture of compliance uh, of this organization is kind of the fundamental uh, uh, analysis that the department's going through here uh, when it's when it's evaluating a compliance program. And if it is a compliance program that is lacking particularly that severely a stand-up culture where they have uh, consistently, I'm assuming, uh, as this questioner is, is posing, consistently discouraged whistleblowing, consistently discouraged individual employees from raising their hand when they are encumbering misconduct, uh, that that would certainly be evaluated negatively by the department in evaluating that compliance program. Okay. Wade, do you have I, any thoughts? I yeah, I would agree. But then again, keep in mind, it's one of many, many factors that are being sure. considered when when evalu uh, when the uh, resolution is being uh, formed. Right. So we I remember dealing with a case where it was not an FCPA case, but it was a pretty significant financial case um, where we had evidence the company you know, w went ahead and destroyed evidence, actively destroyed evidence with multiple shredders running. Um, we were most unhappy. We called in the company and the council. We, you know, had the severe talk, but that case never went to resolution because we never got enough evidence. All right. Um, so let me shift gears a bit to let's say that the investigation is underway. We're in the mid phase now of our agenda here. And if we are talking specifically about an anti corruption, a violation, whether that's FCPA or the anti-kickback statute or false claims or something like that. But I mean, what remediation steps are usually most important to get right? Like where should the CCO be spending his or her time? And Andrew, I'll put that to you first. What would you think are the most important things for you to get right for that sort of a violation? Yeah. I mean, first you should be asking the big question, can we eliminate the risk that caused the issue in the in the first place? So, I mean, that really was the very first question, even before I joined uh, the company, that Albemarle asked itself. So, as many will know, our investigation related to the conduct of agents in our refining catalyst business. And so leadership were asking the uh, question, can we transform our go-to-market strategy by eliminating sales agents? and selling directly to oil companies. And it didn't stop there. It also asked the same question for distributors across our entire company, including our bromine and lithium business units. And that's a really significant decision. You know, the termination of agents is not easy. The setting up of new legal entities, which is often a, a requirement of customers um, in, in the country, the hiring and training of new sales employees and all of the logistics to get the products to those new territories. Now, you know, that's, so that's a big decision, but it didn't completely eliminate the risk. Rather, the risk transferred from agents then to our new sales employees who were then dealing directly with the, the oil companies. So it's a new type of risk, but it's one that's more manageable uh, than when the conduct lies with, with the parties. And then, you know, in terms of the other remediation steps, as I mentioned at the outset, I mean, you, you're basically all in. So I, I talked about the transformation of the go-to-market strategy, but then also the underlying inquire to cash process. So with governance, we co-authored a new global sales policy with the sales teams. We mapped out the entire inquire to cash process and we made sure to include appropriate role separation and manual and system controls. We hardwired our due diligence and contract management platform with our CRM so that a distributor would be automatically shut down if there was some sort of flag. And we implemented various types of monitoring, so entity monitoring to ensure that former agents weren't being resurrected monitoring to ensure that distributors weren't being given payments because those were prohibited under the contracts, and then pri pricing monitoring. And, and really, you know, that, that was the, the bullseye. We, we wanted to make sure that with the core root cause 
around the selection and use of, of agents, we eliminated the risk. And then with our residual third-party sales representatives to distributors, we went right through that end-to-end -end process to make sure that it was all buttoned up. I think Andrew, an important just... point, if you listen to Andrew, is like, it sounds like, Andrew, you weren't solving this for DOJ, you were solving it for yourself. And I was thinking about like, if you have a house, if your house has a bunch of black mold in it, the way you remediate that black mold is gonna be very different if you're flipping the house for a quick flip or if that's your forever home. And I think the evidence around that remediation is gonna be very obvious to somebody looking at it. And I think when, uh, when an outside yeah. party, when a regulator is coming in and they're scrutinizing something, they're looking for this confluent, you know, they're trying to assess it and they're looking for a confluence of, ed of evidence to see that they just put some wallpaper up over this you know, black mold, or are they really trying to rip this out and really trying to get this unhealthiness or whatever you want to call it out of the organization? Yeah, and, and it's an important point there, Nick, in that, um, you know, the, the motivations for some of these decisions weren't purely about the DOJ SEC investigation. So on the go-to-market strategy, I think that there was that perception that the company would, in the medium to long term, be able to sell more catalysts to customers directly because of that direct customer relationship. So whilst in the short term, yes, it may have lost customers, but in the medium to long term, it, 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 particularly in growth markets, it was seen as painful as it was to get it set up. In the long run, it was going to be a good, a good thing. And then similarly, on the improvements to the inquire to cash process, Yes, we were including controls from an ethics and compliance point of view, but it also made the whole process more efficient. They were able to get products out the door quicker. We were able to respond to customers quicker because you weren't scrabbling around looking to find contracts and the like. It was all in one system or you had the right kind of people making sure that everything lined up before a quote went out the door. And so, you know, it, whilst it, a, a, a trigger may have been the investigation, there were other factors that went to actually just generally improving the company in this particular area. Um, Ken, let me loop you into yeah. this here too, because one thing that I got from Andrew was that you know the company made a big strategic decision to improve its compliance risk profile. We're not doing agents anymore, and that's a big undertaking. And I recall numerous speeches from your former boss, the deputy AG, Lisa Monaco, where she will give examples of FCPA enforcement. And it's always something like that. Like, how do they know the company was serious? The company took these big structural changes to reduce their its risk profile that had to be made by the board and the CEO. You know, Andrew does yeah. not have the juice to decide that they're going to restructure their sales operations. I, I don't think. But um, I mean, talk to me, is that how the department looks at improvements and remediation efforts and what impresses it? Uh, certainly, look, increasingly so. Uh, the, the nuance and it, just listening to Andrew talk about the breadth and depth of the types of, of, of uh, remediation that the company had to engage in there. I think oftentimes folks think about remediation around the, the just around the employment related decisions. And I'd, I'd be interested to hear Andrew's view on uh, his experience around you know, some of the clawback and withholding of pay or other employment decisions that were made. But remediation goes far beyond uh, hiring or firing or, or disciplining uh, individual actors, uh, strengthening your your controls and the level and depth of, of those control adaptations is oftentimes a hallmark of the type of a compliance program that the department is oftentimes lifting up as the best examples of uh, of companies that are that they're seeing in their crosshairs. Sure. Wade, do you have any other thoughts along these lines? Nope. I um I I definitely you know my first response is just close the loophole that got you there in the first place, which Andrew described uh, extensively. And uh, you know again think about this. This is remediation is one of the ten delivery factors, and that includes not just remediating the strength of your compliance program but really making things right. So disciplining the employees, you know, compensating victims if there are any, all those are remediation measures is how, how, do, you, how do you make things right while you are continuing to uh, explore the, uh, understand the scope of the misconduct. But there are certain things that you can do right away to close the loopholes, make things right, and that's what needs to be focused on. 
Uh, Wei, I want to stick with you for another minute here because we did have another question from an audience listener. Speaking of the factors and the Phillips factors, uh, they basically wanted to know, are all those factors evaluated equally? And I guess if there are 10, there's like, do, does each factor get each? No. the equation? No. no. How does it work? How does it work? It really is, you know, this, this is a problem when you ask a lawyer a question, they say it depends. Um, so it, it really highly depends on the facts of this. So, so just imagine a case where, so, you know, I'm, I'm going to actually, I'm going to pull up the field factors on my own computer. So you, you have, uh, here are the 10 factors, nature and seriousness of offense, number one. Number two, pervasiveness of wrongdoing. Number three, history of similar conduct. Number four, willingness to cooperate. Number five, existence and effectiveness of pre-existing compliance program. Number six, timely and voluntary disclosure. Number seven, remedial actions. Number, I'm losing track, one, two, three, four, eight. five, six, seven. Eight, number eight, collateral consequences. Number nine, adequacy of civil and regulatory remedies. Number 10, adequacy of individual prosecution. So these are the 10. So let me just take a, a hypothetical. Company um, has a pretty good compliance program. It did timely and voluntarily disclosure. Um, and, uh, but the wrongdoing was pervasive. It affected tens and thousands of people, resulting in billions in damages, lots of people out of their life savings because of the misconduct. Um, collateral consequences would be really big if you indict the company uh you can begin to see the complexity of this like what do we do in the you know i mean they they do have to answer the they the prosecutors have to answer to society really um and so so what do you do in this situation or you know you have uh some a company where everything else is, seems okay but really the wrongdoing comes from the very top you had a really bad ceo who did everything now, is that the case where you should punish the company or is individual uh, prosecution sufficient in that case? So it, it really is going to depend on how egregious some of those factors present. But what is required is that all of those have to be presented. Now, let me also ask, sorry, mention again, the 11th factor that's not in there is the strength of the evidence. Now, one of the misconceptions that I probably should have mentioned first is the tendency to, to, to refer to DOJ um, as a regulator. I have a pet peeve about this because the <laughs> DOJ is not a regulator for very specific regulators have different roles than a, a law enforcement. Regulator is like a parent. Um, they have the right to be checking into your affairs. They, they can come and ask, how is your culture? How is your program? They, they have the right to do that. DOJ as law enforcement, does not have the right to do that unless they're investigating a criminal conduct. So think about the difference between your parent and your juvenile prosecutor down the road. You don't really care about what the juvenile prosecutor think if, you're, you're, if your kid is a good kid or not. Um, because that, you know, that if your kid is a good kid, hopefully they'll never have uh, an encounter with a juvenile prosecutor. But if you're in front of the juvenile prosecutor for a case, then the juvenile prosecutor can consider Oh, is this kid normally a good kid? Um, so, so think about that difference and think about that's why evidence is important because if they do not have the evidence to take you in front of a jury to prove your guilt beyond a reasonable doubt, that's ultimately the test for prosecutors when they evaluate cases. All right. Um, right. Kim, do, do you have any other thoughts along these lines about uh, how the factors get evaluated and how they all fit together into one final equation? No, I mean, way, way is definitely uh, accurate. The, the strength, the strength of the other underlying evidence is is a, is a fundamental uh, consideration. It's the way that all prosecutors are trained to evaluate any types of cases, let alone corporate corporate resolutions like this. Um, what I will what I will say is that these these Philip Factor presentations um, are increasingly ones that are 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 in, incorporating uh, multiple components within the department. You know, we haven't touched on uh, the fact that 
uh, you know, I think one of your questions framed this as a conversation with the fraud section. Well, the U.S. attorney's offices now have their own voluntary self-disclosure policies. The U.S. attorney's offices now are engaging more and more in terms of this types of eva- these types of evaluations. And I think uh, depending on the experience level of the office, the experience level of the prosecutors you're dealing with, uh, the sophistication necessary to to make these kinds of Philip factor analyses uh, becomes a little bit more challenging right now. I, I think the fraud section uh, has the experience. It's been the place that has been conducting these for uh, for some time now. But, you know, that may not necessarily be the case in uh, a U.S. attorney's office that you're dealing with in some other part of the country. All right. Um, Andrew, I wanted to switch over to another issue around program remediation. And this comes from a question from one of the listeners. Uh, How much have they're asking broadly, but how much of a role have you seen ethics such as scenario training, decision making frameworks, uh, redoing the code of conduct? How much has ethics work factored into remediation activities, and does it need a, a bigger role uh, so that you know it can lead to prevention of future incidents? Because now everybody's so ethically conscious and not making it. But um, how did you think through the role of ethics versus just rote compliance activities as you were looking at remediation of the program? Yeah, yeah, it's a really great question, and. You know, I, I think um, I'll start out by saying that in February of 2018, when I joined, it was the same month that the company released its new core values. And I mean, again, that I think one of the triggers for that was the, the fact of the investigation that led to a lot of soul searching within the company and the leadership about you know what the company stood for in terms of its values. And for me, that was actually a very helpful platform. So that first year, I was kind of going out and talking about the values. Uh, they were all new to all of us and just getting that kind of alignment as to what they meant. And I then built on that. So our new code of conduct was our core values in action. And more importantly, I switched the, um, the drafting of the code of conduct Rather than it being focused on legal compliance, it focused on day-to-day common employee activity. So engaging with customers, selecting, managing your suppliers, managing personal data, and so on. And by doing that, what it enabled us to do was go up to tie it more closely to our core values and go down to serve as a platform for supporting policies and procedures. So things like on a... um, global procurement um, framework, the the code of conduct would talk about, yes, you know, not not using third parties to engage in bribery on our behalf, but it will also address more broader procurement core value issues like it will pay our vendors on time, we'll do the right thing by by our vendors. And so within that, you were introducing those kind of ethics concepts tied to those common day-to-day employee activities. And then on the, on the risk assessment side, you know, we did a, a lot of work, which was data backed around cultural health assessment. And so using objective data that we already had, such as our um, investigations metrics, how our code of conduct was being used, how our policies were being used, along with data from other functions like HS health and safety, and about number of near misses, incidents, um, disciplinary actions maintained by HR, and then subjective data from uh, global HR engagement surveys and local kind of compliance surveys. We will bring all of that together and we will present that at the local level to leadership to help facilitate a discussion about the ethical culture within that particular business unit, within that particular site. And very quickly, what was interesting about that was that that risk assessment process, it wasn't like the traditional risk assessment where you would have to go in and collate information before you're kind of doing your work. We already had the information. And so we were going to leadership with more information sometimes than they had themselves, even at that local level. 
And it quickly led to the discussion being focused on the remediation around the issues as much as, as, much as the risk. Mm-hmm. So we tried to address that ethical element at each step of our program. I addressed two, governance with the code and with risk assessment, we, but we did it all the way through, such as with training as well. Well, I, I think you touched on an interesting point when you mentioned disciplinary actions, because it gets to, I guess, maybe the subjective analysis of what should our ethical culture be and how does it look. And honestly, sometimes I think that can be a bit touchy-feely and difficult to quantify. But you know, if you look at disciplinary actions, that's subjective data. And if you say, well, our core value is accountability, except... If you look at our disciplinary data, we've never disciplined anybody above the vice president level for anything. That doesn't sound like accountability to me. And then suddenly there's a dissonance and you can delve into it. Um, But Huey and then Ken, you know, what what is what do investigators in the government, what do they make of this? Because, as I said, sometimes it sounds a bit touchy feely, but it also feels important that companies think about it. So how how do regulators and investigators approach it? Uh, Wei, do you want to go first? Oh, you're on mute, Wei. Sorry. Um, now, now I'm not on mute anymore. Um, <laughs> so this is why you know, that, that, you know, my, my new company starts with the word culture, because, you know, we strongly believe that when, when you do a root cause analysis of just about any misconduct, you end up with culture. And following that focus on evidence so prosecutors focus on evidence and i think we as as lawyers or just responsible people who make statements and claims to whether it's a law enforcement or regulator our statement should be backed up by evidence and one of the things that that i you know we think it's important to do is when when we do culture analysis you know we collaborate collaborate with academics using research backed method to do culture assessments. So this is not, it's its precisely as the way Andrew described it, it really uses a combination of objective data, but also subjective um, assessments. And we use a lot of storytelling techniques. And the reason for this is culture is both. Culture is an, a subjective and objective exercise. It, it is about what exists out there, but it's also about how individuals experience and interpret them and react to them. So I think when you're, you know, when you're, if, if I were sitting in a, in a, in the prosecutor's side of the table on the prosecutor's side of the table still, when someone comes in, presents and makes statements, statements about, you know, our company's culture is like this, I'm going to ask them, what is your evidence? And if the evidence is a survey, I'm going to want to see that survey because I can tell you, I I can't think of a survey, of, you know, really sort of traditionally before we started working with social scientists um, that was done, in my opinion, um, anywhere near scientifically. Many of them, mm-hmm. uh, almost all of them on a Likert scale, which is very limiting, Likert scale meaning the, the one to five, you know, strongly mm-hmm. agree, strongly disagree. Um, th- those are very limiting. Many of them come with extremely leading questions. Um, so, so if you're presenting that sort of culture evidence, I would not think it would be taken terribly seriously. How about if that if that culture evidence, where there was you know maybe some better questions coupled with something that's more objective, like turnover rate, relatively lower than others in the industry, or something else objective? Like, I guess the question is, oh, of course, how, that's what I how, said. It has what? to be. It has to be a combination and it yeah, has right. to be a combination that's weighed appropriately and presented appropriately. And here's what we got from, from the objective data. This is how we interpret the objective data. And this is the academic research-based theory that leads us to that interpretation. It's not Correct. just because okay. I think data, this, I think turnover high, you know, high turnover is not good. I think low turnover is better. Well, maybe not because in some situations, high turnover may be a, a good indicator sure. for something, right? So there's a lot, you, you, there's not a lot of, there's data, but interpretation of data is not that simple. And yeah, we, and also I the would, framing of, of the data to prove the claim is where exactly. a lot of the rubber meets the road. You know? Exactly, that's, that's, that's where right. I would say, you know, I really would want to have that research backing to say, this, we're, we choose to interpret it this way because this is the literature 
on which we base our our, our interpretation. It can yeah, work the, quali you. the quality. Yeah, the quality of those questions there. I, those are oftentimes questions. They become the <laughs> the source of questions within the department. I think. Uh, benchmarking data uh, way, I'd be interested in hearing a little bit of, around uh, your thoughts on on benchmarking data. I know that that's something that uh, you know we've kind of moved moved past in terms of the scientific approach of some of these some of these surveys. But I know that there's a lot of you know there's kind of a, a, an industry around providing benchmarking data, whether it's within a particular industry or across uh, uh, companies of certain sizes. Uh, how important and how uh, how persuasive that can be in terms of uh, some of these surveys and the survey data itself. I mean, a lot of the confusion I, around this question to me is like someone coming to you and saying, hey, I want to create a mosaic. What tile should I use for my mosaic? And it's like, well, you need a lot of tiles, you, you know, for that picture to be formed and for that to be coherent, there needs to be a confluence of uh, tiles of different sizes and shapes like we have to present something i think and if if you disagree with what i'm saying i think we have to present a confluence of uh evidence as as way said that is compelling and that is persuasive uh, mm -hmm. as someone assesses what steps we're taking to remediate something or fix you know a problem that's arisen so I, I wanted to move a little further down our maturity cycle here. So now we're at a resolution with our hypothetical company and they sign an agreement and there's a three year DPA, NPA, some sort of plea agreement, I don't know, probationary period. But I've noticed that especially with DPAs and probation agreements, you know, there's this interim reporting for three years or five years or something like that. I'm curious about what actually goes into those reports um are you know especially if they come once a year and it looks to me like really the the company is supposed to have progress reports about are we is our program still effective has anything else come up how are we doing on our goals stuff like that but i just wanted to get a bit more color about what goes into those interim reports during the three-year dpa um can I'll start with you and then maybe Andrew and Wei. Uh, like, what goes into these reports for the three year agreement? Yeah, I mean, look, it's it's still very much focused around the, the pillars of the design, the resourcing, the effectiveness of the compliance program itself. Uh, oftentimes it's updating, updating the department on any uh, testing that's being done of the compliance program, any additional improvements that are being made in terms of controls, changes in personnel, uh, depending on the investigation and the status of the investigation, it could be an update related to information uh, and as additional cooperation that's being that's been provided or will be provided in the coming months between the reports themselves. Uh, and then, you know, again, oftentimes these resolutions require ongoing self-reporting of allegations. Uh, of misconduct that are similar to the underlying misconduct that led to the the the, the resolution itself, and so uh, companies oftentimes are including those types of additional self reports of allegations that are being made, investigative steps that were taken, uh, resolutions and findings of those of those internal investigations as follow up to those additional self reports. Um, that's the bulk of what a lot of those reports look like. Sure. And uh, Andrew, what are your thoughts about how to make sure those interim yeah. reports after the agreement is signed, like how that all of that, all that process works well? Yeah, I mean, what I think the broader point, which is really interesting is, you know, as a compliance officer, you could actually be having way more engagement with the department on the substantive aspects of your compliance program and then as uh, Kath mentioned the day-to-day -day investigations that you're running post-resolution and actually during the investigation. So, you know, after your resolution, you, you, so, you know, at Mar, we kind of came to a resolution at the end of, uh, of September. You know, that was several months after the most recent update on the program. And so it's important, I think, that it's not a requirement, but I felt it was important to set uh, a new baseline of, you know, where the program is at because there were some things that we had done in the interim that we wanted to, to, to communicate, that then served as the baseline for the testing plan. And the testing plan is a requirement under the, um, for, for us, our NPA. 
And, and what's interesting about that testing plan is that it's kind of multifaceted because you're testing, you're demonstrating how you're testing the existing program. You're also rolling out continuous improvement and you're then testing the make sure that those improvements are being rolled out in the way that you expected them to be rolled out. And then at the, the back end, at the end of that first year, you've got to do an annual report on how you're progressing against that testing plan. And then there will be perhaps some interim updates on that plan throughout that year, depending on the level of confidence and trust that you've built up with um, the, the, the department. But in addition to all that, as Kenneth kind of mentioned, you've got more frequent updates in relation to, to allegations. And the scope of that reporting commitment you know, goes beyond you know, specific allegations of bribery and fraud. It, it, it can you know, extend to you know, broader things like evasion of, 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 of controls. And then um, finally, I would that there's also um, obligations around um, mergers and acquisitions, particularly when you're in a disposal situation where you're disposing of a significant part of, of your business and, and uh, entering into discussions with the department about making sure that those, those commitments that you have made as a company are going to carry through to the company that you are, that you are disposing. So there is a lot of engagement post-resolution. Uh, I mean, do you ever, would you ever have tensions, do you think, between, say, you and the general counsel, you and outside counsel, or what is the process to make sure everybody's coordinated on what we are providing in these interim reports? Because you're right that the compliance officer now plays a, a bigger role, maybe, than right. in the preliminary stages. And I just kind of wonder how everybody plays well together in the sandbox. Sure. So, I mean, I think it's, um, you know, you, you've each got the discrete roles, the outside counsel, the general counsel. And um, and so that clarity of accountabilities that you have during the investigation also has to carry on through in the uh, post-resolution um, world. And and so um, I, I kind of start with a broader point that we, div we, we had a, a testing plan that just happened to also address the requirements for our testing plan for the department. Just we did not want one plan for ourselves and then one plan for the department. Our plan was the plan, um, both in terms of our testing and our, and our improvements. Because if you try and coordinate different types of planning for different types of audience, it's going to be pretty, pretty tricky. And so through that plan, you're getting that alignment with outside counsel and with the legal department so that you can go in as that united front with the Department of Justice. But as important is the alignment that you have with other internal functions, because you know, there's that perception, perhaps, that when an investigation is all done, it's announced that you know, we're all good. But actually, it's really important because the scope of that testing goes beyond, as I was saying at the outset, your traditional ethics and compliance program, you got to make sure that you're holding the feet to the fire of internal audit and your finance function, maybe your sales function, your procurement function, who've all got commitments as part of that testing plan. So that need for consensus and alignment goes is broader internally and then gets funneled into your engagement with the department. All right. And Hui, do you have any thoughts and uh, advice about what compliance officers should keep straight as they're in that DPA period with reporting and everything else that they're doing? Um, I think the only thing I, I think might be in, might be of in, interest for people to know about is that, again, depending on the prosecutor, their interest in these reports vary widely. So I have encountered prosecutors who really couldn't care less about them. I mean, they, when, when I became the compliance counsel, um, they were like, oh, thank God somebody's going to read these reports. That's your job, not mine. Um, and, uh, and, and then there are those who are extremely interested um, and, uh, you know, would pour through everything. So, you know, understand uh, where is your prosecutor's interest level, because some of them just see this as, a, a, you know, like, 
they're prosecutors. Some of them see this as sort of like this is the probation office's job. Like that, I don't, I don't do that. I'm on to my next big case, um, and I'm not interested. But some are very interested in seeing the company transform and want to make sure it's on track. That you know, there's no recidivism. So some get very involved, and there's everybody in between. So um, get a sense of what your prosecutor's interest levels are. Okay. And then the last question I had for our hypothetical. Yeah, and this goes that. Go ahead, Ken. No, I, yeah, just really quick. I was just going to say that that Way's point, uh, again, underscores what I was saying about uh, not just the interest level of prosecutors, but also their experience in evaluating these kinds of reports. Uh, again, you know, the, the fraud section has an entire unit within the fraud section whose entire job is evaluating and considering these types of interim reports from companies that are, are, are making revisions to their compliance program. They have folks that do that every day. They are compliance, uh, there are attorneys that have deep compliance experience. And so they understand how to ask tough questions and follow up can be a real challenge if you're dealing with the fraud section. It can be rigorous by is what I mean by by challenging compared to if you are dealing with a, a local U.S. attorney's office, uh, as Wade described, they may not have particular interests, but they also may not have the depth of experience to really uh, conduct a rigorous probe uh, and really engage on some of the presentation of materials that are provided in those interim reports. Okay. And um, Ken, actually, I was going to put my next question to you is that um, what goes into evaluating whether a DPA has been breached? And I am not asking that for anybody listening because there may or may not be a specific company that might be facing that question right now. <laughs> We don't but know. just in Here general, we don't know. Um, <laughs> how would yeah? Well, yes, actually, we don't know. But um, yeah. how does the company, the, the department, and way then? I'd love to hear your thoughts on this too. How do prosecutors evaluate this? And are how much is this a subjective thing versus objective criteria, or like what goes on there? Yeah, look, there are provisions of 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 the DPA uh, resolution itself uh, that spell out what the obligations are of that company, uh, ongoing cooperation, uh, and providing self-reporting additional allegations of misconduct uh, are are requirements in all of those agreements. And I would say that quite frequently, uh, uh, those those two particular provisions uh, end up uh, being the underlying basis of a, of, a, of a potential violation. I would say that uh, the, the other, other type of conduct that has often brought a company back into the department's uh, uh, crosshairs as to a potential violation of a DPA is if, it, if it's uncovered that they did not provide evidence uh, that was relevant uh, in some cases, highly relevant to the department's evaluation at the time of the resolution itself. If, if the company failed to provide that that type of evidence, um, then a then a breach of the DPA itself uh, would 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 oftentimes start to get considered by the department. Okay. And Wei, do you have any thoughts about um, this issue? Which you know, like I said, it, it seems like a moving target for a lot of compliance officers. Yeah. So basically think about it as a pass fail course. Right. So um, except it's even vague, even more vague than a pass fail course, because most of us have no standard by which if you pass 60 percent, you pass. Um, and uh, if it's below 60 percent, you fail. But there is no such percentage there. It's a feel. Does it feel like a pass? Now, a pass could be a D. It's still a pass. So. Um, I, I will just share this experience where we had a company that at the end of near the end of its DPA, I read its last report uh, from the monitor it was under a monitorship. And uh, the the company in its three years has consistently failed just about every control test there is. There is there was no improvement year over year. And uh, the end of three years looks pretty much like the first year with the same amount and same types of control failures. And um, I raised it to the prosecutor and I said, I, you know, if you ask me, I don't feel I don't I do not feel like they passed. Mm -hmm. And this 
this particular prosecutor was one who just wasn't that interested. He's like, do you really have to make a big deal out of this? Um, and I said, well, it is, this is, you know, my, I'm the expert and that's my opinion. So take it, you know, you're, you're the prosecutor, you can take it or leave it. It went to his supervisor who sort of saw my point. Uh, supervisor convened a meeting with the monitor and the company, the monitor whom I had not seen a single time in three years. <laughs> this is the only time he, he showed up. Usually it's the his deputies who show up. He showed up. He sat there, smiled from the beginning to the end of the meeting. He says, I don't see a breach. Um, so there was no breach. <laughs> so it, it is. So what I'm describing is this is a very highly subjective and highly political in the sense of the people involved. You have multiple stakeholders involved. Um, they all have to agree, but most importantly, the prosecutor has to agree. And when you have a monitor, my God, how does the prosecutor go to court? Remember, DPAs are filed with the court. How do you go to court and say, we think there's a breach, but the person that we appointed to monitor this company doesn't think there is a breach. It became almost impossible to prove that case. So that's mm -hmm. why they had to walk away, even though the supervisor saw the concerns without the monitor's support, they were never going to be breached. So right. um, it's, uh, yeah, a little inside. Uh, um, unfortunately, inside experience is that this is, you know, it, it's something you can see from the outside is the lack of objective criteria. Uh, Andrew, do you have any uh, thoughts about this question as well? Yeah, I mean, I think a um, couple of points. The obviously the concern about whether your your DPA is, is being breached and then also the something more close to the hearts of compliance officers is that end of term certification. And so, you know, if you're seeing things that are happening that you're not happy with, what's your what's your your release valve? You know, you don't want to be waiting until the end of that three year period and saying, I don't want to sign that that certification. How, yes. how can you be having that 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 honest you know discussion both internally but then also the need to escalate and maintaining that position of trust with the department of of being frank with your your own assessment of how the DPA is going uh, so we have about 10 minutes left and I wanted to get to a few more listener questions including one that has come in a lot uh, that I will just summarize as people would like to know, what potential impact will the end of the Chevron doctrine from the U.S. Supreme Court uh, several weeks ago, what that might have on corporate compliance? And I'll tack on on Justice Department investigations, because honestly, I'm not sure that Chevron would have that much impact on criminal proceedings. I may be wrong. I am not a lawyer, but uh, I will ask all three of you who are lawyers. Um, what are we supposed to make of the end of the Chevron doctrine, given who this audience is of compliance officers who are often working on sensitive investigations? Um, Ken, I'll start with you and then Wei and then Andrew. Like, How much uh, of an issue is this going to be? Uh, I think it's uh, yet to be seen. Of course, I, I suspect that Chevron is going to be a, uh, resulting in some real taxing of judicial resources, so so to the extent that you're looking at criminal proceedings, the speed uh, of resolutions might be impacted a bit there. I I I would struggle to see what uh, what impact it would have related to the departments the department's work uh, here, though, particularly in the criminal space. Uh, Wei, what do you think? Yeah, I, I agree in terms of impact on the department, precisely because the department is not a regulator. Um, yes. And uh, so so that impact is is minimum directly. But I think it certainly, you know, makes things a lot more uncertain. Um, there is, like Kenneth said, there is more uh, there. There will be taxing of the judicial resources and uh, lots of uncertainty in terms of, you know, What's, you know, do we do this today and the rules will change tomorrow? What do we do? So I think some of it is I almost if I try to put a positive spin on my thinking is maybe, you know, it, it may force more rigorous um, legal analysis from the compliance community. So it's not just that, you know, you don't do something that just because it feels like high risk or it's currently defensible today. 
but really go through that rigorous legal analysis about the different ways that you would defend your your decisions under different circumstances. Uh, Andrew, do you have any thoughts about this? Yeah, I saw, I think, a recent post from you, Matt, where you were basically alluding to what you said earlier. And I was like, I'm so glad you said that because that was what I was feeling in the context of, you know, department criminal investigation. I was thinking about on the wearing the, the antitrust hat, you know, were there kind of potential ramifications there, particularly with the FTC and role base. And then sure enough, you know, there's now questions about, um, you know, the legality of the FTC um, ban on non-competes as a, as a as an example mm. i mean just stepping more broadly back and wearing kind of a chief compliance officer is just another thing to add to the pile right compliance officers are faced with a whole range of new and emerging risks like more state level data privacy law modern slavery uflpa this is just another thing which there's part of their horizon scanning that they need to keep an eye on and they're relying on legal counsel outside counsel to kind of read the tea leaves of what's going to what's going to happen, and then adjust accordingly with with the compliance program. I, I would just want to um, remind everybody that you know really compliance officers live by what is in the sentencing guidelines, what are in the Justice Department's guidelines for an effective compliance program. Those are guidelines, and the department changes them. The department deviates from them. They are not rules. They don't go out for public comment. They just they are. Um, so they don't like they're beyond the scope of Chevron. But I did hear one regulator. Um, and I wonder if we had like the head of corporation finance from the SEC on this webinar. I bet he's buying mm -hmm. in by the gallon right now. But one regulator said we have now shifted from a two body problem, regulator and company, to a three body problem of regulator, company and court. And three body problems like the Netflix TV show, which is awesome, are inherently unstable and nobody has any idea where this ends. But um, I just I don't see that this is going to derail compliance programs or make your ability to have a good one less important. Um, Nick, were you going to say, say that there, that, yeah, I'm just was, nodding along with all the brilliance that's coming from you, Matt. I agree. Ken, what were you going to say? I, I was going to say that, you know, there's there were some other really important Supreme Court decisions that I think could have an impact, uh, a more direct impact on some compliance programs. I, I, I was thinking of Snyder uh, and, uh, you know, gr additional limitations of uh, of the of the, the public corruption statutes there. Yeah. Uh, particularly, basically, you know, saying gratuities are, are are not unlawful under that statute. And there's a lot of compliance policies that, you know, have relied upon those legal principles of those types of gratuities being unlawful. Uh, and so, you know, compliance programs, all companies should really be uh, reassessing their policies in that gratuity space in light of that in light of that decision. Uh, and I, I guess I'm, I'm mindful to just, to just say, look, this is one of those challenges where compliance and ethics, um, you know, have to be considered simply because those gratuities can be done doesn't necessarily mean that they should be done within your organization, uh, because quite frequently, uh, gratuities can be a, a slippery slope to additional um, uh, misconduct within your, within your organization. Yes. Um Plus, I'm still uh, unclear on if you're offering a gratuity, how are you going to explain that away to like, where's your documentation that this is just a gratuity or else this SEC will be calling you up? Uh, like there are plenty of internal control mm -hmm. provisions that could like, I just don't see that a lot of this is going to trip up the compliance programs anytime soon. Um, yeah, that's but I it. think, I, ahead, I do Rick. think, sorry, I know we're limited on time, I'll, I'll keep this brief, but I, I do think Snyder, in addition to actual legal uh, implications, does prevent, provide some kind of ethical quandary, right? So how, how do we, in you know, with a straight yeah. face, train our international colleagues when the U.S. standard is such? Yeah. Um, so I, you know, I also think I would, mm -hmm. I would probably uh, modify, uh, Matt, uh, in terms of what I live by as a compliance officer, I live by um, the you know the values that my company I hope you know says that it believes in. Um, I I always find it somewhat ironic that a, a group of people who do ethics would sort of take as guidance a document written for convicted felons. 
it just makes no sense to me. It never did. When I when I first got into <laughs> compliance, people told me like, oh, you got to read the sentencing guidelines. I'm like, why? Um, so um, so think about it. I mean, it really it, it is about the values. It is about what you believe as a company is important to you and how you should do things. And that's what you need to defend. All right. Well, we are pretty much out of time, so I will leave it there. But Wei Chen, Ken Polite, Andrew McBride, you covered tons of ground for us, gave us a lot of really good stuff here. Very much appreciate your time and the listeners' time. And Nick, if you want to give a farewell and wrap it up, I'll turn it back over to you. Hard to follow that up, but man, what a phenomenal day, guys. Thank you guys so much for coming on this panel. Um, really appreciated all of your insights. Uh, so many so many questions, I think, were answered, and so many of the um, you know, the things that folks struggle with in terms of the clarity of what they need to actually do and how this is going to be looked at and how it's going to be considered. We had that unveiling, uh, that peek behind the curtain, like Matt said in the beginning. So hope everybody enjoyed Ethics First Day. You know, we do this every Thursday at noon Eastern, not a full day like this. We do a one hour uh, webinar episode. So invite you to join us. The replays for all this stuff will be on our YouTube channel. Uh, if you're not a subscriber, uh, if you are a subscriber, uh, resources and stuff like that will be sent out uh, very quickly. But one more round of applause for this amazing panel. This keynote was uh, so good. Thank you guys so much for coming. And oh my gosh, we broke 12,000. I know you guys are new to the ethics verse. We've never seen anything like <laughs> so this. was phenomenal. 12,000. We might even break 13,000. Amazing. Guys, thank you so much. Hope you enjoyed uh, Ethics First Day. We will see you soon. Love your work. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.